Hello everyone, Steve Rail again with uh, Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative. Um, uh, please allow me to share my screen as we get prepared to uh, to get into the second part of our series on our Sakasp release spot review. Um, for those of you who might remember Bob and Doug McKenzie, welcome to part two. Um, in part two, we're going to talk a little bit about breast management practices, also going to continue on into part three. In the interest of time, let's go ahead and jump right into it. First thing I want to mention about BMPs when it comes to what we've learned from the special Sarkos Release Spot uh, database is that program initiation is a pretty low hanging fruit and it is pretty important. It is, I'm going to call it the driver. Um, with this one is extremely important in our endeavor to stay out in front of this disease. Um, to prove my point, I want to talk a little bit about how we came to this to this particular um, assumption. Following the 2018 Sarkas Police Spot epidemic, shareholders were polled about some of the specific strategies that they wish that they had incorporated in 2018 to avoid the epidemic proportions that we had encountered. And the number one response was in replying that they would start, have started their program earlier. Thus, establishing a method to predict an, appro uh, uh, an appropriate and profitable early start date became a major emphasis to the shareholders in the Shareholder Innovation Committee, to the Research Department, and to the, other, and to the Agriculture Department in, in general. Since then, we have uh, come to the uh, assumption or to the conclusion that GDU accumulation uh, from the planting date, from the day you plant, and as well as the relative canopy closure uh, are relatively good tools that can be established, promoted, and implemented for our cooperative to make good decisions about when to initiate their fungicide program. We promoted this then last year in 2020, and this resulted in a mass movement toward earlier program initiation. And I'm looking forward to showing you that data in some of the following slides. I also want to mention that since then there has been mounting evidence that has been uncovered that confirm that the disease requires program attention well before the onset of first symptoms to the leaves, well before we see the first spot. We need to be out there trying to delay the onset of the disease to ever getting a foothold in our field, because once it gets a foothold, it's extremely hard to stop that particular runaway train. Other thing, another thing I want to mention about program initiation is it does actually have two particular benefits because it's also a great resistance preventer. In this particular book, Fungicide Resistance in North America, they make a couple of, uh, uh, they, they relate to or make a couple of references to this end. And that is, first of all, they say other fundamentals of resistance management include starting the fungicide spray program early. And they go on to say making the first application before or at observation of the first symptoms. They also go on to say that a better solution might be to apply a protectant fungicide on a preventative schedule and then apply the at-risk fungicide, such as a super tin, a triphenyltin hydroxide, or, or, a, or a triazole fungicide at the onset of the actual disease development. Now, for those of you keeping score, that last particular suggestion should look and smell and taste an awful lot like our EBDC0. EBDC0 is a protectant fungicide that we go out there to basically delay the onset as a protectant fungicide, which also then all gives us better opportunity to, 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 to prevent the disease from getting a foothold, but is also a great resistance preventer. So give consideration to that early EBDC0 application. I want to spend a, quite a bit of time on this. On the, on the massive implications of an earlier start. Now, the first thing I wanna to bring to your attention is the next couple of slides are gonna look a lot alike, but the first thing I wanna mention is that 2019, this is 2019 data. So this is the results of the 2019 Sir Special Sarcospa Release Pod database. In both cases, I have two Y axes. I have the revenue per acre here in green, corresponding to the green line in the graph. And over here I had in the yellow uh, font. I have the Sarkas Belize spot ratings from low to high corresponding to the yellow or gold bar in the graph. Also want to mention that the numbers in the graph represent the number of fields represent that were represented by each data point in 2019. And I think it's really easy to see that as you delay the full program, fungicide program initiation, that your Sarkas Belize spot rating increases with a corresponding decline in your revenue per acre. I also want to bring to your attention, because in the next slide representing 2020, this will be quite a different story. There were only 14 shareholder fields 
that were sprayed in the last four days of June in 2019. Everything else was sprayed after July 1st. 2020 ends up being quite a different story. Bringing in 2020 data, same basic for format, format only. I'm using extractable sucrose now here on the left y-axis, same sarcastic blue spot rating here over on the right y-axis, the brown representing to the brown line here, and the ESA representing the green line here, as you can see, as we delayed Sarcast release spot program initiation, Sarcast release spot rating increases with a corresponding decline to the revenue breaker, even as early as we started in 2020. But we had a good crop coming in 2020. Again, I tip my hat to you for the level of control you were able to obtain, considering that we were canoping, getting close to it on June. 20th. But I got to tell you, what's really interesting to me with this graph is when you look at the fact that almost 90% of the database participants began their program on or before the earliest applications made in 2019. Look at the number of applications made prior to June 26th versus those applied later. Great job getting out in your field and getting out in front of the disease. And I think it proved itself out in the ability to be able to produce a 30 ton crop and a 17% sugar. I'm going to do something a little different than I did last year. You know, I usually group the data, but here's a scatter graph of the actual input data points. Okay. And it still shows a great storyline. Here we have Sarkas Belize spot rating along the left y axis with increasing or de delayed date a full pro fungicide program initiation. And as you can see, there really isn't much difference if you started here on the 16th, 18th or 20th. But when we start getting into that 24th, 25th, 26th is where we start to see the, the best fit line start to trend away from the 3.0 area here where we started out at. This is probably where a critical junction or a critical interaction can occur on years where we have early starts and early canopy. Somewhere around that 24th, 25th, 26th is where we need to have protectants out there to assure that our field or that the inoculum is not having an opportunity to germinate and get a foothold in the field. If I take a look at extractable sucrose per acre this time along the Y axis you and use the scatter graph approach and apply the best fit line, you can see a pretty strong trend downward in extractable sucrose per acre as you delay the fungicide start. And looking at the previous line, I would say that there's a pretty good chance that a lot of this responsibility for this declining extractable sucrose per acre is due to the increased in sucrose release spot for delaying your fungicide program. I do want to bring to your attention, there was a few people that, quite a few fields here that did start early, still did not get high, relatively high extractable sucrose per acre, but there are some extenuating circumstances. Some of those, uh, quite a few of those actually were harvested early. If you took them out or moved them back towards the other side by starting earlier, um, I think that you would see that even this could even be a more drastic um, representation of the, of the opportunity lost if we don't get an early application to prevent the onset of the disease. So when we talk about terminating program initiation, how do we figure that out if we're shareholders? Well, first of all, I wanna say that uh, probably the easiest is to uh, go out and make sure that you, we are spraying when our leaves are still about four inches apart from relative canopy closure. And that does mean walking out into the fields and measuring your leaves before the first true leaves touch. What does this do? Well, it does give us that protectant down at the lower leaves. It's the one opportunity that we truly have to get good coverage down in the lower leaves. And it prevents those early infections from getting a chance to occur. We also have proven that GDUs can predict generally speaking, from the time when you plant, approximately when we should be thinking about making our first application. And notifications will be made available um, as many ways as we can to get it across to you when we start reaching those critical thresholds of about 1,500 GDUs from planting date, which is about the time we should be hooking up to the sprayer and have it pointed out the driveway towards our fields. For those of you that uh, may not uh, coincide to either one of those, I would say that the data would strongly suggest that you have to be getting this done prior to the end of June at the very latest. Waiting any longer for July 1st or after the 4th of July simply is a recipe for failure on years like 2021, where we have relatively early beets planted in the ground. They did undergo a little bit of stress, but I think they're going to come on strong now with this recent rain that we've had, and, uh, and, and we need to be going out there and protecting them early. 
So another easy way that was brought up by one of the research staff, Cody Gruen, he said that if you're carrying your pocket guide, the easy way to walk out into your field and determine whether you have four inches from relative canopy closure is approximately about the width of your production guide. As you can see, I threw the ruler down there about four inches wide. If you can wipe that in between the leaves and hit one, you're probably a good chance that you should be out there starting your fungicide program. So let's continue on now beyond program initiation. Let's talk about some more BMPs. These are the best of the rest. I want to talk a little bit about it now about the influence of air and wind. If you look at this particular slide here, you can see that this uh, picture was taken with some wind blowing this flag over here. And you can tell that the air was moving because of the shapes of the clouds. But I want to take this one step further because I find this particular picture kind of interesting and actually kind of funny because if you're thinking about the person who took it, he realized that there's a little bit more to air and wind to get this particular photo shot. And that would happen to be technique and timing. So obviously, if you were going to try and take this picture and make this cloud look like it's coming out of this particular horn uh, from this guy blowing on this statue, you would have to arrange yourself to get just the right technique and wait for just the right timing. And I think the same can be said when it comes to air and wind. Air and wind is mother nature. It's going to throw it at you and it is what it is. But we can utilize technique and timing to be able to minimize the influence of the air and wind when it comes to spraying our Chicago leaf spot. Now, air temp, I'm not going to spend a lot of time each and every year now for the past two years. We've not seen a correlation to Sakas per least spot rating to air temp, but each and every year we have seen a correlation to extractable sucrose per acre to increasing air temp, and it's generally been a decline. We see a decline in extractable sucrose per acre when our average Sakas per least spot air temp at application timing gets higher in the day. It's hard to say. It truly is hard for me to say that this decrease in ESA is, is tightly woven or tightly correlated to the timing. But I would have to say that the later in the day and the higher the air temperature, generally speaking, the more at risk we are of our spray droplets evaporating. And it's just probably not good uh, 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 technique to, to be spraying in very, very dry and hot conditions at risk of our, dry, of our smaller droplets uh, evaporating before they have a chance to reach their destination and exert their fungicidal properties. This is 2019 wind data, a very good data set for wind being an environmental factor at a 0.7. You can see that the Sarcospa leaf spot category here on the left y axis from low to high severity. It, the Sarcospa leaf spot severity will increase as generally wind speed, average wind speed at application timing increases. Now, I do want to mention this is average across your program, okay? So this is not a particular spray, but average across the program, this is how the fields did. Again, these are the number of fields representing each database point, and you can see that there's just generally a decrease in Sarcospa leaf spot control as wind begins to increase. If we look at the 2020 information, again, it's the same format, cost per least spot rating with increasing wind speed. Um, not quite as good a data set for correlation, but I think that you can see that there is a generally a very, very strong trend for decreased cost per least spot control as our average wind speed increases. But there is one other piece of information here that I want to bring to your attention, and that is that steep slope here. Perhaps this is an indication of the question that I received from a couple of different consultants is what is too high? Well, I would have to say that based upon this information, that if we start getting into anything above a five mile per hour wind, depending upon the direction and, and some of the other specifics, we may be getting into that situation where we know that we are potentially impacting the efficacy of our application or that we might want to be making sure that we add an adequate or a decent deposition aid that helps keep your droplets in the right spectrum and prevents as many of them as we possibly can from being blown away or evaporating before they reach their destination. Again, if we look at the scatter graph information, merely it's showing pointing out that with increasing wind speed at the time of your applications averaged across all of your applications, you generally see a decrease in your extractable sucrose breaker. Again, not saying that we can say definitively that that is related to your cost release spot score, but, but worth, perhaps worthy of note. As far as timing, Okay, so in 2019, this is 2019 data, and again, I want to bring to your attention that the orange or brown bar represents the Sakaspa Lee spot rating over here on the left Y axis from low to high, and the green bar represents revenue per acre as designated by this right um, Y axis over here that with 
de as delaying in time of day, we generally started out with some of our lowest circadian relief spot scores between eight and noon, and then by delaying later in the day, we we see an increase in circadian relief spot severity with a corresponding decline in revenue per acre. So it would have tended to say that we want to make sure that we stay out of the heat of the day when we're trying to make applications because it does stress the system, increase the likelihood of some evaporation to our spray. But when we bring in the 2020 data, that was 2019 that we looked at previously, it's a little bit messier. First of all, more people shifted to earlier in the day. So the, I had to split the, the data just a little bit differently to get a uniform number of fields represented by the numbers in the slide here, okay? And in this particular case, when we moved it a little bit further to the left, averaging your spray application timing earlier in the day did not necessarily give you a lower circadian release spot rating as indicated by the gold bar here relating to the right y-axis in this case, but it still wasn't too bad on the extractable sucrose per acre. Generally speaking, though, once you got into the mid part of the day, or late morning, you generally gave, got your, your best circadian release spot uh, rating, and then it started to slowly decline or increase back up. Severity did later on in the day with a corresponding decline to extract the sucrose breaker. A little bit more uh, con uh, confusing to understand. Basically, I, I think that if we take a, if we take out the early material, it still indicates that it's very similar to the data from 2019. In that, generally earlier in the day, you you have less risk of evaporation. But in conclusion, I would have to say that perhaps too early and too late can each have its pitfalls but you have to weigh your risks and your benefits. If you have a lot of fields to spray in a given day and a small window to do it, chances are you're gonna be better off starting earlier in the day where there may be a little bit more due in order to stay, take uh, uh, to weigh the risks of being out later in the day where you have a tremendous amount of opportunity for wind blown uh, droplets and evaporated droplets. So this will be the last portion of our version number two, or part number two, and that is our what are, what are the differences or are all EBDCs created equal? So in this particular slide, we have ESA on the left y-axis corresponding to the brown bar or the brown line in the graph. And then we have circadian release spot severity from low to high uh, in blue represented by the blue bars. Um, in this case, the white numbers represent the number of fields representing each database point. And so what I will, working from left to right, let's first of all, take a look at the wettable powder. This is the stuff that's finely granulated, finely ground, and therefore they're able to put more active ingredient on it. So it's an 80% wettable powder. It, this is the stuff that generally gave us the lowest circadian relief spot score of a 2.6 and provided the greatest opportunity for revenue per acre or extractable sucrose per acre in this case. By going to the 75 DF, we did see an uptick in the circadian relief spot uh, severity and a general decline in our extractable sucrose. This is about five to seven percent less product at a two pound per acre rate than what you can get with an 80 percent wettable powder. So you are able to get more product on, more active ingredient on with an 80 WP at two pounds than you can with a 75 DF at two pounds. So that's very likely corresponding to some of the differences we've seen. And this is consistent over both 2019 and 2020. When we get to the four pound liquid flowable, we see the highest level of circadian relief spot and the lowest extractable sucrose per acre. What does this mean? We don't know for sure. I think that it could mean that perhaps there are formulation issues with the flowable that just the EBDC or the transition metal zinc and manganese don't particularly like, or maybe even more likely is when we have a liquid flowable product like this, it doesn't like to stay in suspension and maybe we're not getting the jugs rinsed out and getting all of the active ingredient into our tank, thus giving us something less than a lethal dose, uh, the full lethal dose that we'd get from the 75 DF or the WP dries that we know are going into the tank. So to, fi to finish or to summarize our part two, Proper and timely fungicide program initiation is simply the most important practice that you can implement to avoid allowing the disease to gain a foothold in your field. Program initiation should begin at about the time when the closest leaves in the canopy are still about four inches apart. Don't forget that early use of protecting fungicide is also a good resistance management technique. Try to avoid winds above five miles per hour or try to avoid the heat of the day applications or you risk loss to spray droplets or to drift and evaporation. And 
take into consideration that there is the possibility that perhaps not all EBDC products may be created equal when you're making your diet, your buying decision. So once again, with that, I want to thank you for viewing in, taking a view of part two of our five-part series. And I look forward to talking with you again when we continue with some more best management practices in part three. So with that, I'm going to stop share here again and uh, pause and we'll see you in part three.